Very excited to welcome to the show someone who has appeared on the network, on the conversation, but has not yet appeared on the damage report, running for state senate in New York's 49th district for the Democratic and Working Families Party. Uh, Teresa McCalman, welcome to the damage report. Thank you, John. Uh, very Thank excited you. to have you here. Uh, the New York primaries are shaping up to be potentially one of the most consequential. I think one of the most closely watched set of primaries. There's so many important races. And um, I, I, as we said before, we were talking before we went rolling, um, you know, some of my audience might not be familiar with you yet. So I wanted to give you a chance to introduce yourself, talk a little bit about uh, your decision to run and what you're bringing to this campaign. So, I, like you said, my, my name is Teresa McCalman. I'm a mom, I am an educator, and um, I, I'm a former homeowner who lives in Schenectady, which is part of the district. Uh, last year I ran for mayor, and uh, that was my first campaign, and I lost by only 105 votes against an eight-year incumbent. Wow. And that spoke true to me. Yeah, I think it was the most glorious defeat I've ever had. It was, like, beautiful. It was gorgeous. <laughs> um, I know most people don't say that about losing, but uh, it was expected that I wouldn't get three, uh, 1% of the vote, and I lost by only about 3.9% of the vote. So um, it was it really spoke to the fact that the the district that I live in, or the portion of the district that I live in, which is Schenectady, the city of Schenectady, um, the, the residents were tired of the same old, same old. And I did not put forward like issues and say, these are your issues and this is what's what I'm going to run on. I asked them what were the issues and then I screamed that from the mountaintop hmm. and said these are the things that need to change. And I think because of that, that's why I came so close to winning because they were tired of being ignored, tired of not having someone who um, was actually their voice and representative, and they wanted something different. So I decided um, since the establishment, the Democratic establishment, was uh, very upset that I ran for mayor, and I said, well, I still want to be that effective change. So. Um, I had to sit down and think of why I wanted to run for Senate. Mm -hmm. And these are like just a few things that, that, that um, I've been pretty much uh, I put together. Um, I'm, I'm running mostly because there is a desperate need in my community and the district for Alita who has actual experience with the struggles of real life. Like the majority of the people in the district, we don't have that right now. I'm running because black and brown lives matter, even more so than ever. And I've been saying this for the longest. We currently have an antiquated septuagenarian career politician who has lost all relevant connection to what is actually of importance to the people, the youth, and community as a whole. Mm -hmm. He lacks vision of what matters to real people, and I'm those people. Mm -hmm. You're those people and 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 everyone in the district and I are what's important and what's matter what matters and he doesn't get that We've been fighting all our lives and our parents lives before us to get these career politicians to see that they are there for us Not for their own selfish goals not to be bought out by big businesses Nor to kill us slowly with defunding our education and Medicare which they're doing I'm running because we need health care now yesterday and last week. Hmm. We needed it before the pandemic. I'm running because I've always known who our essential workers are and that they deserve not only a living wage, but a proud wage, one that matches their superhero jobs. And that's what we've been calling them now, but they've always been that. Yeah. I'm running because those same essential workers, our heroes, have been des not denied safe staffing, and you can see that behind me. Contracts worth their time, paid sick leave, which we now have, a union, Walmart, not saying anybody in particular, <laughs> affordable and accessible health insurance, and minimum wage of at least $15 an hour. I'm running because $1,200 is not enough. It was never enough. Mm -hmm. And we need a universal basic income. I'm running because I've always seen where our truth lies. Who makes up our foundation and our community, our district and our state? I'm running because our time has been stolen and replaced by photo ops and borrowed ideas. 
I'm running because we need a representative who lives like us, works like us, and struggles like us. And I believe I believe I'm that person. Well, you know, you know, one of the things that I'm I'm glad that you acknowledge as you're going through all those problems is uh, some of them have been for some people more evident in the past few months. The struggle yes. for healthcare seems more significant in a time of a pandemic where so many people have died and continue to die. And, um, you know, the, the nationwide conversation about law enforcement seems more relevant, but obviously the, the problems you're talking about are not new either. But but for some politicians, they provided an opportunity to potentially at least act like you take it seriously. So in, in these areas, I'm curious, the, the current incumbent that you referred to there, Republican James uh, Tedisco, what has his response been to the pandemic, to these protests? <laughs> Does he seem like with a primary challenge, he I'm gets sorry. it? <laughs> uh, I'm guessing no. <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought I was going to keep a straight face on that one. Mm -hmm. um, no, not at all. So when the the when the state went on lockdown, um, I waited to see what was happening with our leaders. Like, would they? Especially, I was watching, of course, him very closely, Jim Tedisco, because I wanted to see whether he was going to wake up and see all those things I listed, and, and there's a whole bunch more, right? If he was going to wake up and recognize that um, him sitting back on his laurels are not is not going to take make it anymore. He needs to come out, be up front and and lead mm -hmm. and and be that 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 guiding voice at a time where none of us knew what the heck was going on. Yeah. We were unsure about everything and nothing, nothing. Weeks went by. And I said to my um, team, I said, you know, it's 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 going to be hard to campaign. Duh. It, it's hard, period. I mean, in the middle of petitioning, this is when everything happened. Yeah. happened. It was hard then. It was even harder to continue because, you know, you have to knock on doors, which we couldn't do any longer. We had to ask people for money, which none of us had the black heart to do at this time. So I was like, what can we do? So instead what we did, we decided instead of calling for money that we will call all of our neighbors and our friends and everyone in the district, especially our elderly and ask them, are you okay? Mm -hmm. Do you need anything? Do you need food? Do you need hand sanitizer? Uh, are your family members okay? Are you unsure about certain things? And then we got answers like, of course, they needed certain things. And we went out and we helped. We went grocery shopping for some people. We helped them get some amenities that they needed for their home. And also, they were like, well, what's going on? Are we going to get, this is later on, are we going to get that stimulus check? Are we going to get this? Or what's going on? And they were at, we had to keep sending them to all these different sections of the internet and most of them didn't have internet. Mm. And I said to my team, what we need to do is gather all of this information and put it in one place so that if they are able to access that information, they can just go to one page on my website, the COVID-19, one of the first ever out of all the campaigns. And I mean, even before the governor started his, and we put everything on one page for every part of the district that had that information available. And then we still continue to make calls to those people who did not have access and said, these are the things that you need to know about certain things, even down to their fur babies. We made sure that <laughs> everything that they needed to know was there. Where was our current representative? Checking ticks on his cat. Like that's the picture that he posted. And then eventually he decided he was gonna give awards to the heroes months later. Yeah. I understand, thank you. Thank you so much for recognizing these people who have been working, have been doing this since before the pandemic. And thank you for recognizing their hero jobs now. But a lot of them still can't pay rent. And I definitely cannot take that award to my landlord and said, I'm sorry, I can't pay your rent. But my senator thinks I'm great. Yeah. Like, you need to do more. And that and you're not doing much. Now he's handing out hand sanitizer. Needed that back in March. What happened? Like, yeah. what are you doing? Like, he's just waking up. Yeah. And that's what I'm saying. Like, you've been in there for so long that you forgot what you were there for. And you forgot what you're supposed to be doing for us. Yeah. You know, um, if you end up in, you know, state government in New York, obviously one of the big challenges going forward will be what's going to happen with law enforcement. And and it seems yes. like at every level there's a huge resistance to almost any change. Um, you know, I've been watching to see 
what different cities and states have been doing. And I know that like New York um, outlawed chokeholds, even though I had been told that it was outlawed literally years ago. I guess it needed to be done again. I don't know. So um, I know that you've been speaking at Black Lives Matter rallies. This is obviously a huge thing going forward. W what's your vision for, you know, what what impact you could have on law enforcement in New York? So I, I've, I've, yes, I've been asked to speak and I've given a, a few speeches and I've also participated in some online Zoom conversations. And just recently I was in a conversation with a couple of other elected officials and they spoke about 50-A, um, which has been repealed. Tedisco has gone against that. He, did, he voted no. And I think that's anti-police because why wouldn't you want your, your police officers or your police force uh, being held accountable for um, their actions or abusive practices in the community. And also they spoke about defunding police. And, and I, that, that term sounds like we want to just never, ever pay police officers. No. And an elected official uh, pointed this out. He said um, when, when he was mayor uh, in his previous careers, a lot of the time they had to take that funding and buy ammunition. Every year they were told to buy ammunition. Mm -hmm. But what did you need that for? Like, why are you militarizing your police force against civilians? Like, what war are you preparing for? So defunding means that we're taking money from buying bullets and actually putting those millions back into the community for community safety, for community support, maybe some um, health services, uh, mental health services, human services that will actually support people during crises. So when someone's having a mental breakdown, instead of putting those millions into police force to come and 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 tackle them or tase them or even shoot and kill them, instead a healthcare worker, a mental health care worker or a social worker goes out there and handles that crisis. So that's what defunding police means. And that's what we need to do. And they also mentioned that police officers um, all of them, no matter what color they are, have certain set of biases. I mean, people do, right? We all do. We mm -hmm. have a certain way that we look at other people who don't look like us or speak like us or even worship like us, you know, and that's just human beings. But then we learn, right? So but as a police officer, you're set to a higher standard. So, but they're human. So they work off of their biases. But what we should do is not just that implicit bias training. Mm -hmm. And I said this before when I was running for uh, mayor. Police officers need to go through a culturally responsive training. And what that does is at first it helps them to recognize what they have within them that's preventing them from doing their job without their bias supporting their decisions. So they have to recognize their racism, their biases, and then work through that and figure out how to stop it at the door before they go and take and, and do their job. And and it's more it's more to it, but they, they have to understand the community that they're policing before they go to police them. And I, I wrote this kind of a um, this this law when I was a, an intern at the Senate, and it was about culturally responsive training, but for teachers, because as an educator, and I am, you need to understand the community of your classroom before you go to teach it. You can't teach what you don't know, and that's the same thing with anybody in the service job. You cannot serve what you don't know especially if you have certain biases against it. And and I'm going to continue saying this until we get it done. You need to have culturally responsive training if we're going to have police officers who are not recruited from the communities mm -hmm. that they're policing. It has to happen. I, it makes a ton of sense. Um, well, look, it's going to be, I'm sure... Uh, for you and for the district, an exciting last week running up to an incredibly consequential election. Um, if someone watching this wants to find out more about your background and your platform, uh, where can they get that information? They can go to TeresaForSenate.com. I'm not sure if you're going to have that up. But I, th I think we're going to add that. <laughs> that's how you spell my name. It's, uh -huh. it's spelled slightly different. It's a little Irish Catholic. Um, but it's TeresaForSenate.com. You can also contact me. My phone number is on the website. You can call me. I'm totally accessible. You can email me at TeresaForSenate at gmail.com. You can find me on all social media platforms, well, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, um, mostly those. And um, I'm, I'm totally open to having a conversation and learning what I don't know so that I can represent you properly. Awesome. Teresa, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Thank you for having me.
For more political news breakdowns, interviews, stories of activism, and me trying my hardest to care about the occasional big celebrity news story, subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the damage report. And you can ring the bell wherever it is so you don't miss anything.